So we steadily move on now to our next uh, session. Again, as I say, James already uh, mentioned a little bit about what's going to happen next. So we've already talked about gaming, about uh, what governments are doing, strategies around the world. And we're going to touch upon now on health care. Okay, health care and how VR, using VR to train the 21st century healthcare students. So I believe our gentlemen are ready. Please put your hands together for two gentlemen who's going to delve into the topic and share more with you, making sense of, of what it's all about. Please put your hands together for the clinical assistant professor at Stanford University School of Medicine, Mr. David Axelrod. That's your cue, cue to clap, fantastic. <laughs> and also uh, his colleague, uh, the founder of Lighthouse, Mr. David Sarno. Hey everybody. Well, thank you very much. We're, we're really happy to be here to um, discuss the Stanford Virtual Heart. Um, I'm Dr. David Axelrod. I'm a um, pediatric cardiologist at Stanford. So I take care of children that have congenital heart defects. Um, and this is my colleague and collaborator, David Sarno who's the founder of Lighthouse, um, which is a company that's using virtual reality to uh, teach healthcare and science education. And we are true believers that virtual reality is going to change the way that we look at health and science education. And it's really going to be able to permanently change the landscape that, uh, that we see as people are training and understanding medicine and science. So we're going to look at virtual reality education through the lens of congenital heart disease and congenital heart defects, because that's my specialty and I take care of these children. Now that's a little bit different. Everyone knows about adult heart diseases, which are really related to coronary arteries because of smoking, poor diet, poor lifestyle. Um, and that's a little bit of a different topic. But these are congenital heart diseases, which means that these babies are born with these defects in their heart. And it's due to an abnormal formation of the heart when the, when the embryo is still forming. And because that formation of the heart is so complex and difficult to visualize and understand, there are, there are just countless variations of what can occur with a baby's heart as it's forming. And many things can go wrong to, wrong to create different congenital heart defects. It's really challenging to understand that, to visualize that in three dimensions in your head. Um, and it's really very challenging to teach people what it is that they need to know in order to take care of these babies. So at Stanford a few years ago, we started to use technology um, and some animation tools that came out of the gaming uh, community to use those tools to teach both trainees and also families and children that have congenital heart diseases about their heart and, and to help them to learn and understand what's happening. And so here's where we started. So a number of years back, we sat down with our uh, chief surgeon, who's a world-renowned, world-class pediatric heart surgeon, one of the best in the world. Um, and to be fair, uh, this doesn't look like a very um, intuitive picture of what a heart defect might look like. Um, and it's not that easy to understand. I think everybody would agree. To be fair, he was just about to go into the operating room to perform a 14-hour surgery on a three-month-old baby. And so he sketched out what it is that he was going to do and had it in his head very clearly. But it's very difficult to make other people understand that, and especially a non-medical person like a family. So we took this, and we took it to our animators who, like I said, were in the gaming industry. And we were able then to create something that actually looked maybe a little bit more recognizable, um, this being the aorta. We were able to add color and add to, to add some interactivity. And we actually, a few years back, created a really great uh, iPad-available app um, that allows you to interact with the heart, with this congenital heart defect, and actually also to then perform a simplified version of the surgery so that you can understand what this surgery is and to understand then what the consequences are and, and what you would need to do um, in order to, to maintain your health if you had this surgery. So that was 2014. And we're going to move now and show you next um, where we think we're going to take this and where we're going with, uh, with these um, education projects in congenital heart disease. So Dave is going to demo for us here. And as we do this, I'm going to teach you in the audience a little bit about congenital heart disease. So David's going to get situated. Let me just get your cord there. You're tethered. There you Thank go. Thank you very much. OK, so what we're going to learn about today is we're going to learn about a, one congenital heart defect that's called a ventricular septal defect, which you may not know what that means. And by the end of this talk, you will. 
So David's going to look up ahead at the ventricular septal defect. And he's going to take that out from, from really kind of a library or a number of different heart defects. So we'll have a panel of all of the congenital heart diseases, which, as I said, are, are myriad. And so we're going to look at this heart, and we can actually look, look at it. You can see that it's alive and that it's beating. I can tell you, when I went to medical school, this isn't how we learned it. It was pretty flat. It was reading books. It was having people's descriptions. But we never got to spin a heart around and look at it this way. We never got to explode the heart open to look at different pieces. We never got to pick up certain parts of the heart and actually look. So there's the hole. So that's a ventricular septal defect just means a hole in the ventricular muscle. And that's what that is right there. So it's an abnormal formation that happens when the baby's heart is forming in utero as a fetus. So you can see that the wall is in between these two parts of the heart. And that connection is abnormal. And if it's big enough, it has to be repaired with an open heart surgical procedure um, that our surgeons perform. And then I take care of these, these patients after surgery every day. So when you're done kind of looking around at the outside of the heart and you've gotten somewhat of a good sense of the external anatomy and physiology, you can actually jump inside. And so now you're actually inside this ventricular septal defect heart. So you're able to walk around. You can look up. You can identify the heart valves. You can identify certain aspects of the heart that you may not have learned about before. So we can look at all different kinds here. We can actually look at the ventricular septal defect which is here, so you can get a real sense of what's happening there with both the anatomy, and if you notice the red blood cells that are colored red coming through that hole, we can, we can teach the physiology of ventricular septal defects um, as we learn about this in VR. So here's a, David's holding the ventricular septal defect, the small version, right next to the larger version, which is just behind. So we think that the potential of using this, having an immersive, interactive, moving, living heart that you, that you actually are able to get inside, is really going to change the way that we teach medicine and science. So if we take a moment, the next step would be, well then, so there's the heart problem. So what would you do if you had, a surgical, you had to do a surgical repair? So here's a heart problem where the great vessels on the heart are actually placed in the incorrect location. It's called transposition. So there's the aorta, which is the yellow here, and then there's the pulmonary artery, which is right next to it, and those are abnormally placed. And so what our surgeons have to do, now mind you, this is in a th three or five day old neonate that this surgery is done. So these blood vessels in real life are, you know, maybe a centimeter, maybe in size. The coronary arteries that they reimplant as well are about the size of coffee stirs, a couple of millimeters. So David's going to show you really just, again, kind of a simplified version to help people understand what this surgical repair entails. And so it entails picking up these blood vessels, putting them back in the correct location. And then you have a near anatomically correct heart, which is what happens after surgery. But it's crucial that patients that have this surgery done understand what's happened to them and, and are able to actually take part in their health care. And we think that VR can help them do that better. And I can't tell you how many times we've had patients that come to us from all over the world as we're a major referral center at Stanford. They come from all over the world with a scar on their chest and have no idea what surgery it was that they had done Hello, 10 years ago. And, and that's a real shame. So we took this picture a couple months back when we went to visit the Stanford Medical School at the anatomy uh, sessions in the anatomy lab. And this was what we saw. And so we're still doing it this way. This is the way that I learned it you know, 20 years ago. It's pretty flat. It's not really interactive. I don't think these students are going to be engaged with it. So we think that what we can do is use VR as a technology to pull these students in and to really get their learning and their understanding of the, the medicine and science for you know, medical students, trainees, college students, high school students, to understand anatomy and physiology much better. And so the next step for us will be to create the, the virtual body, um, which will be able to integrate then our other organ systems. So we've been really fortunate uh, in this collaboration. We've had the support of the Pediatric Heart Center at Stanford um, and also support from Oculus uh, in developing this application. Um, our contact information is here, so please feel free to reach out. We're also going to, I think, have a demo here for a little bit on the side. Um, if anyone wants to actually try it, we'd love to teach you a little bit more anatomy and physiology. And we're also in hall number 17. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks. OK, ladies and gentlemen. 
we have got uh, we've made a specific time for questions, quality questions from our audience members. So, uh, any questions for for gentlemen on stage? I'm interested in other academ uh, other companies, academic institutions in the United States who are really pushing this technology, virtual reality education for medical, for healthcare uh, professionals. Do you, do, can you help me? Sure. Um, so we think that within the next, say, six months, six to 18 months, that VR is going to be integrated into essentially all of the medical school curriculums across the country, probably across the world. Um, we think that the applications that are being built um, by us, frankly, and, and others as well, um, are of high enough quality that they will actually um, um, then be able to be tested and proven um, as um, excellent ways to learn and retain knowledge. Um, there are a number of other groups that are doing certain different takes on either different anatomical parts um, or uh, different approaches to how you interact uh, with the body. Um, but um, we're relatively fortunate at Stanford in that we have a, kind of a world-class heart center, which is why we decided to start there with congenital heart diseases. Um, and we think that relatively um, seamlessly we'll be able then to, to move into adult heart disease and also the virtual body as well. Does that answer your question? Are there important uh, companies who are really focusing on this field? Well, I'd say Lighthouse is one. Uh, uh, perhaps <laughs> um, MIT or, or, or groups. Other you know, um, or is there a platform where they are? Uh, there, there's, um, there's are definitely, organized? there's definitely interest among the medical community. I think right now it's so new. The technology is so new, um, and um, the applications are in medicine can actually be pretty crucial. Um, that it takes a fair amount of, of startup energy and cost um, and um, investment to get a program started. Um, but certainly there are, uh, as the speaker before mentioned, there are other programs that are working in healthcare, um, children's hospitals um, you know, near us, um, and we're, we're happy to collaborate with them as well. And I think that's one of the advantages is that as we all move towards this immersive learning, um, I think that the technology and the content's just gonna get better and more advanced. Thank you. Okay, other questions from our audience members? Well, thanks very much. We'd be happy to see you in, uh, in room 17. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, once, once again, hands together for David and David. Thank you so much. <laughs>